Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. A uh, very uh, warm welcome from a chilly Johannesburg this morning. Um, uh, welcome to all, all our members from the uh, South African Chamber of Commerce in Singapore, all our guests, uh, members from the South African Chamber of Commerce in Korea, um, and welcome to our event. Uh, this morning's event being uh, the opportunities that the African Continental Free Trade Agreement will create for global business. Um, I think a subject which is very topical at the moment and um, seems to be of uh, much interest. Um, we're very fortunate this morning to have participants from all across the globe um, and a very warm welcome to all of you um, from Canada through to Korea. Um, so welcome. Um, we will do our best this morning to try and unpack this uh, very topical issue for you. Um, we have a, a great speaker who will um, run through this. It's going to be a very conversational flow today. And um, if you have any questions, please send them through on the Q&A. Um, Bahani will be very happy to have a discussion around those questions and try to answer any queries that you may have. Um, we have a lot to cover, uh, so I think we'll kick it off straight away. And um, I'd like to hand over to uh, Timothy Dickens, who is the president of the um, South Korea Chamber of South African Chamber of Commerce in South Korea, just to say a few words as our co-host. Thank you, Mark, for that, that kind introduction. And firstly, to everyone out there, welcome and thank you so much for, for putting aside some time for this webinar. I think it's fantastic for the cooperation between both our, our brother corporation, the Singapore Chamber of Commerce, of course, the South African Chamber of Commerce in Korea, and also from APSA, APSA site. Um, this, this afternoon or this morning, wherever you are in the world, I'm just going to give you a quick introduction to the South African Chamber of Commerce, um, and also a slight touch on the work that Korea is sort of doing in terms of investment into Africa. Uh, the South African Chamber of Commerce in, in Korea, we founded probably three or four years ago, so we're still in the infancy stage. Uh, in terms of the, the network, there's quite a strong South African community. A lot of that is based on uh, the members which are teachers on this side. In terms of businesses, there's a lot of uh, individual businesses in terms of uh, food industry, beverage industry. A big business at this stage, as yet, we do not have any South African companies on the ground in Korea. Now, the benefit that we see from a South African perspective and, and in the more global sense, the, the African perspective is the qualities which Korean companies and Korean investment can bring into the region. I think, as most of you will know, there are a wide variety of conglomerates in Korea, the Chevels, the sort of the big ones like the Samsungs, the Lotte, Daewoo, Hyundai, that are already on the ground in and are looking to increase and expand on that investment they've made. But over and above that, I also think there's a massive market for the sort of SMEs and mid-sized companies that are also looking to do business in Africa and to invest in Africa. I think one of those areas in particular would be the, I think Korea is one of the leaders in the sort of fourth industrial revolution, so to say, with the digital market, uh, fintech, gaming, etc. And I think that's one way where I think Korean companies can also add a lot of value for investment into, into the African region. So I think as Mark mentioned, the, the topic this morning for the, the benefit of this free trade agreement within the African corridor, I think is very relevant. And I think all of those that are interested in Africa and would be on this webinar and in general, in business in general, I think we see the potential in Africa and from our perspective as a chamber in, in Korea, over the next 10 to 20 years, and it is quite a long-term project, we see Africa is exploding in terms of opportunities. From a Korean perspective, I think there's also a huge amount of development that can happen. Currently, I think Koreans sort of import and export with Africans in total is only one and a half to two percent of the, the whole import-export market, which means that there's a huge growth potential. Uh, Two things that the Korean government has done is they have committed themselves to significantly increasing investment in Africa the next five and 10 years. And one of the, the parts which they've done is they've created the Korean African Foundation, and I think they're also on the webinar today, which is a, an arm of the Korean ministry, 
which deals exclusively with um, the African region. So in general, from the Chamber's perspective in, in Korea, we are looking to develop all kinds of business uh, from the perspective of both in, inward and outbound from Korea. And I hope that through these kind of conversations and collaborations with people on the ground in, in South Africa, Singapore and Korea, that we're able to go from strength to strength. So thank you for the opportunity and, and thank you for, for joining our webinar this morning. I think from here on, I'll hand over to Permishen, who will give an introduction as to the conversation to this morning. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Tim. I, I, I would say good morning uh, to to the participants in Africa and good afternoon to the participants out of out of Asia. My name is Pramishan Naidu, and I am the head of the Middle East and Asia corridor at Absa Bank. Absa Bank is one of the largest, uh, largest, uh, re, uh, largest regional African banks with a pre-COVID market capitalization in excess of ten billion dollars. We present in ten in twelve countries with international officers also in London and New York. The Middle East and Asia corridor is part of four international corridors, being the US, UK, Europe, China. And these corridors are essentially to service our multinational clients headquartered in those regions. Our role as APSA Bank on the continent is to facilitate trade and investment opportunities between particularly in my case, Asian corporates and Africa. And we've been extremely successful and continue to build our franchise. Today, we are certainly proud to be associated with the South African Chambers of Commerce in both Singapore and Korea. And we continue to look to build this association uh, as well as our strategic, uh, uh, our network of strategic partners in the Southeast Asia region. There's certainly growing investment and trade flows into Africa out of Asia. And clearly these are to take advantage of the multiple opportunities that the African continent offers in terms of uh, future growth. We've seen a number of commodities, construction and consumer focused businesses emanating out of Asia and increasing their presence and activities on the African continent. From NAPSA perspective, I think we see ourselves having two key differentiators. The one is a sector focus combined with international client coverage. And the second is global reach with local on the ground African expertise. So today we are here to talk about the African continental free trade area agreement. And I'd like to display this in, in terms of numbers. The AFC FTA connects 1.3 billion people across 55 countries with a combined gross domestic product of $3.4 trillion. Africa accounts for just 2% of global trade and only 17% of African exports are in, intracontinental compared to 59% in Asia and 68% in Europe. Therefore, the AFCFTA has the potential to be a game changer for the African continent's economic prosper prosperity, as well as in terms of the acceleration of the growth of the African middle class. The United Nations Economic Commission for Africa estimates that the agreement will boost intra-African trade in excess of 52% in the next year or two. The pact will create the largest free trade area in the world measured by the number of countries participating. The, the FTA launched on the 1st of January, January this year, and this coincides with probably the most significant socioeconomic disruptions that the world has seen in many, many decades. And it comes at a time when the world is actually turning away from cooperation and free trade. So the implementation of the FTA is going to be incredibly interesting. To tell us more about this and how multinationals can benefit from the FTA, I have the pleasure to introduce Bohani Shlangwane, a seasoned trade finance banker with very deep knowledge of, of the Southeast Asian market, having spent many years living and working there. Bohani is MD and Pan-African Head of Trade and Working Capital Sales at APSA Group. Across to you, Bohani. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Prem. Thank you very much and good morning and good afternoon. Uh, to everybody that has joined us this um, today. Um, from uh, Chile, Johannesburg, I hope you are keeping warm if you are joining us from Johannesburg, but otherwise, uh, good morning and good afternoon to everybody joining us, joining us from all over the world. <clears throat> I'm going to spend a few minutes just talking you through 
what the free trade agreement is, what Prime has referred to. Essentially, what I'm going to do is I'll just spend a few minutes just giving you a sense of what it is. So what exactly is the free trade agreement? I'll then also give you a sense of what has transpired from the 1st of January 2021, which is when um, the free trade area came into force in terms of uh, trading. I'll also then give you a sense of which is the, the subject of this discussion of what I think or what we think the benefits of free trade area would be for global companies. And then, of course, in the process, I'll give you a sense of what we, we, we imagine is going to happen in the next few years. But I think before I get into the snapshot and give you a sense of what it is, uh, let me just take a, a bit of you know, a, a history view to say in um, 2019 in Kigali, Rwanda, um, the AU countries, 54 countries, uh, agreed to uh, bring, put together the free trade areas or to allow the free trade areas to come into force. Um, essentially, what that meant is that they agreed to establish the free trade area within the African continent. Now, prior to that, there had been multiple initiatives and um, that ranged from some of them, the Abuja Treaty in 1991 that established the African Economic Treaty and multiple other initiatives that established the regional economic agreements or regional economic blocks. Specifically, what the 2019 agreement in Rwanda meant was that countries were now going to go and agree to basically put the free trade area in force, agree on a schedule of tariffs in terms of what percentage of goods and services would actually uh, be zero tariffs, as well as agree on the thorny issue of rules of origin, which I'll come back to. Um, what then was agreed to was that on the 1st of July 2020, trading would start under the free trade area. Of course, we know what happened um, in 2020, and the AU decided that it would be inappropriate to start trading. Uh, they postponed the start date to the 1st of January 2021. In the, in the interim, um, the AU agreed already for the establishment, on the establishment of the uh, Free Trade Secretariat to be hosted by Ghana in Accra. And Mr. Wamkele Mene was appointed the first Secretary General of the AFCFTA. Now, uh, and, and my colleague Prem has already uh, touched on this issue. So the AFCFTA in a, in a, in a snapshot it's a free trade agreement that brings together 54 countries in Africa. One is not included, which is Eritrea. It touches on 1.2 billion people and would create a single market that is worth $3.4 trillion. Essentially, and Prem touched on this point as well, it would increase intra-Africa trade from the, uh, you know, about six, 16 to 18%. It would increase it by 52% uh, over the next few years. And Prem again touched on this point. Why is the free trade agreement area, why is the free trade area agreement critical for the continent? It is critical for the continent because uh, as we indicated, despite the fact that 17% of the world uh, population is in Africa, only 3% of world GDP is generated in Africa, and only 3% of world trade is generated in Africa, and only 2% of wealth manufacturing output is generated, and also 1% of steel production. The number of things, right? They reflect, I suppose, a legacy of what I would call disparate and uncoordinated development activities within the African continent. They reflect the fact that Africa continues to export mainly raw materials and import finished goods, uh, notably uh, you know, indicating limited industrialization in the continent. As we speak today, uh, only about 16 to 18% of total Africa trade is into Africa. 
And I think for context, it's important. And uh, again, Premission did allude to this, that about 52% uh, of, of, of total Asia trade is intra-Asia. 50% uh, of total North America trade is into North America, and 70% of intra uh, of total EU trade is intra EU. Um, it's in, it, it's important also, and this is an important point to highlight that, you know, in the 16 to 18% intra Africa trade that we referred to, uh, three quarters of that actually happens within the regional economic uh, blocks. Now. It, this is an important point for us to highlight that whilst, for example, we speak about um, the coming together of 54 countries in the form of this free trade agreement, in essence, what we are talking about here, it's the coming together of eight regional economic blocks, which are actually experiencing varying levels of economic and trade liberalization within them. The biggest of them probably being the South Af the SADC community, as well as um, the East African community. So what does it seek to achieve really in practice? What it seeks to achieve is to reduce tariff barriers on goods and services traded within the African continent uh, for goods that are made in Africa so that they can have advantage over goods that have been made elsewhere. Um, thus far, 54 countries, as I've already indicated, have signed up to the free trade agreement. Importantly, 36 countries have already ratified uh, the agreement. In other words, their parliaments or their legislatures have signed up legally and deposited what we call articles of ratification of the agreement. Now, the free trade area uh, agreement is divided into two phases. The first phase focuses on a trade in goods and services and sectors, and I'll touch on that. It seeks to reduce tariffs um, to zero for 90% of goods traded within the African continent within the first five years for the developing countries, so for the bigger economies, and seeks to do so uh, within 10 years for the least developed countries. Um, this is a very important point because one of the issues with trade agreements, it, it's, it's how they seem to benefit the bigger countries within those areas. And, and therefore, the AU in this regard, I think, learned from the lessons from the other agreements to make sure that they needed to be differentiated implement, implementation schedule in as far as the least developed countries are concerned and the developing countries are concerned. The, the agreement also seeks to increase this 90% uh, target to 97% uh, within 10 years for the developing countries and 13 years for the least developed countries. It also aims to open up services trade for five priority sectors that I will touch on at a later stage. In terms of phase two, um, which would come in later, phase two, uh, talks to protocols on, competi on competition, investment, intellectual property, and e-commerce. So in summary, if you're asking yourself where the free trade area is, the free trade area or the AFCFTA, which is the acronym that, is, that has been adopted, sets out a framework for tariff reduction, a gradual, gradual tariff reduction in Africa to enable um, the crystallization of a single market that comprises 54 countries and today is worth $3.4 trillion. Now, before I get into what are the opportunities that exist, and maybe before I even give you an update in terms of what has happened since the go-live date of the 1st of January 2021, it's important that I highlight the challenges uh, that Africa is dealing with so that even as I deal with what has happened, excuse me, since, since January 2021, you can contextualize um, some of these challenges. Of course, the key challenge for the AFCFTA um, is to set up a legal basis uh, for the treaty, uh, for the country level signing, and to achieve ratification. It's also quite important to close on the subject of rules of origin 
defining the, the level of value added in Africa for the traded goods. This is an important aspect because failure to deal the rules of origin question to say how much, uh, what is the percentage of value add that should be added within the African continent for goods and services to qualify to be um, trade with within the free trade agreement. It's a critical part for this. And then of course, um, Africa had to manage, or the AU had to manage the issue that I have referred to, which is uh, you know, the, 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 the challenge in terms of dealing developing countries, but also making sure that the least developed countries don't become the biggest losers. And then of course, ensuring that uh, we can close on the schedule of tariffs. Now, this of course is in addition to a whole lot of challenges that have been you know, reflected on in various publications and various conversations, which refer to the infrastructure deficit. And in, in terms of this, there's an infrastructure uh, you know, development requirement of $100 billion per year over the next 10 years, which if you look at it, is an opportunity. Um, there's the question of the non-tariff barriers that, you know, in essence, non-tariff barriers sometimes can tend to be a bigger barrier to trade or intra africa trade than, than tariffs themselves. So focusing on non-tariff barriers becomes very important. And then there's the issue that I, as a banker and many others that are involved in banking, uh, in financial institutions, both commercial and developmental, must all, always be you know, uh, you know, working through, which is the trade financing gap of about $100 billion. Now, in terms of what has happened, therefore, since the Go Live Day, which actually encourages me a lot as, as somebody who speaks a lot on this subject uh, and is a very strong believer of the free trade agreement. One is you already have 36 countries that have deposited articles of ratification, as I indicated as well as the fact that 34 countries to date have submitted a schedule of tariffs, meaning that they can start to trade uh, between themselves. Um, and this particular one does make me quite happy, the next one, because the, the question of rules of origin was a, was a critical one. But already um, there's been an agreement on rules of origin on eight to one percent of product lines covering about 4,000 global tariff lines. So, so in essence, what it means that um, within the countries that have submitted um, uh, the schedule of tariffs, there's already been an agreement on 81% of the product lines and as far as rules of origin is concerned. The goal of course was to achieve 90% tariffs within five years, as I indicated. Of course, now what you have is um, incrementally over the next five years, those would be implemented. Importantly, it's that today we're sitting at 81%. Current countries are already negotiating on a schedule of specific commitments on trade, on services, which I think is an important aspect given um, you know, the, the, the importance of services today in global trade. And the five priority services, and I think this would be very important for global businesses to be aware, is transport services, communication services, financial services, tourism services, and business services. Importantly, since the 1st of January 2021, and once again, this makes me very happy, is that members can enter preferential uh, trade subject to four requirements uh, that I've already touched on, one being the fact that ratification uh, of the ratification of the agreement itself, uh, tariff offers in terms of the 81% of the tariff lines that I've referred to, uh, domestic, domestic uh, legislation to administer imports and exports, as well as agreed customs documentation, specifically as it relates to rules of origin. Rules of origin. So that's where we are um, in terms of that. There's, there's multiple conversations. In fact, uh, later today or after this uh, this session, I'm joining uh, the, the, the Free Trade Area Secretariat um, with other corporates talking about uh, the creation of regional value chains 
um, as a result of the free trade area. And what corporates need to do, what banks need to do, that got some engagements are happening, and that the session I'm referred to, it's being led by the, uh, the Secretary General of the FCFTA. Now, so how would a global corporate benefit out of the free trade agreement? It's critically, it's the creation of a single market that is worth $3.4 trillion with 1.2 billion people in 54 countries. And this is worth an explanation here as, as, as I, you know, I come to close talking about these issues. One is if you were a global corporate that uh, sets up shop in, uh, let's say, in, in Nairobi, in Kenya today, or in Ethiopia, um, before the implementation of the free trade agreement, you essentially would have to deal with 54 different tariff regimes when you had to move your goods across the African continent. But after the free trade agreement implementation, you are essentially for 90% of goods and services defined under the free trade agreement to qualify, you now know exactly that you are dealing zero tariffs. And I believe this therefore in, you know, makes it easier for global corporates that base themselves in the continent to be able to move goods and services across the continent. Essentially meaning that Africa is open for investment, the, the movement of goods and services is streamlined and thus creating immediate opportunity for investment in uh, obviously fast in power generation, in various kinds of infrastructure, roads, rail, digital, and all kinds of infrastructure. And then lowering of the trade barriers uh, also presents a massive opportunity for global businesses that seek to set up shop in Africa. I think what is important here, and, and, and let me touch uh, for a minute on this. I think one of the things that we observed, and this is why the discussion about the creation of regional value chains across multiple sectors, it's a very important one for the African continent, is that COVID, if anything at all, as challenging as it, it's been, it did show that there is an opportunity for Africa, because I think we all know that when it came to PPEs, when it came to vaccines and many multiple other required as a result of the economic and social disruption uh, that was brought about by the COVID challenge was that they, there was unfortunately a shortage of all these goods. And I think an opportunity therefore, you know, presents itself for the, for the creation of these regional value chains across these multiple sectors. So it's a very important point. And then of course, the impact of this is it's that it's, 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 it's estimated that 100 million jobs over the next 10 years or so would be created. It creates transformational growth opportunities um, within the African continent. The World Bank estimates that uh, the successful implementation of the free trade area can raise GDP across the continent by about $450 billion per annum by 2035. This is very important and therefore says to the global corporate sitting anywhere in the world, there is a real economic opportunity within the African continent. As indicated, there is an infrastructure development requirement of a billion, of $100 billion per annum over the next 10 years. And you can ask yourself, uh, so how would this be financed? And I think the, the, there is a lot of conversation around the financing of this from the development financial institutions, from the commercial financial institutions, um, as well as the, the public sector itself. So, so ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, the free trade area, it's a crucial driver for economic growth and industrialization and sustainable development in Africa. And, and I think more than any other time that I have seen in my career, which spans over 18 years in banking, the kind of momentum and practical steps that I have seen to develop and to ensure that the free trade agreement is implemented, it's quite um, encouraging. Um, already, there is a level of intra-Africa trade that is growing 
on the back of the um, the go live uh, date on the back of the practical implementation in the first of January this year. Um, what should we expect in the next uh, few years as I close? It's, I suppose we can expect a diversification of trade exports out of the continent. And that in essence, it places a challenge to say, the companies that seek to participate in this diversification should consider basing themselves in one form of another, or another within the African continent to be able to um, uh, take advantage of this diversification. There would be increasing economic integration in terms of the African continent uh, economies, as we said. I think um, over the next few years, we expect that the intra-Africa trade should grow into at least plus 30%. Um, that also means that there, there will be growing and continuing reduction of dependency on, 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 on Africa, sorry, on imports of finished goods and machinery. And as again, in my view, this places um, a responsibility or a challenge and an opportunity on, on global businesses to consider uh, joining a whole lot of other global businesses that I have set up shop here in the African continent. So that, ladies and gentlemen, it's a snapshot in the interest of time of where we are in terms of the uh, free trade agreement and in terms of regional economic integration in Africa. Uh, thank you very much for your time. And I look forward to answering a lot more questions as we engage together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bahani. Thank you very much for that insight. Um, it certainly has um, raised a number of questions. So um, uh, I hope you're ready for them. Um, we'll, we'll fire away straight away. So, um, you. you know, I think, um, you know, as you said, this is a, this is a very exciting initiative. Um, the, the AFCFTA is an exciting initiative, but one of the questions that have arisen is, you know, multiple initiatives like this have been started in Africa before. Um, why, would you, why would you believe that this particular initiative um, will succeed? I think that's a very important question, Mark, and, and, and I think people are right to raise that issue. They are right to raise that question. But I do think that unlike the multiple initiatives that we have seen, there's something special about the free trade area. The free trade area agreement is not driven by just governments. And I think that's an important aspect. It's driven equally importantly by the private sector. And it's not driven by the private sector because the private sector is deciding to be nice to the African continent. And here I'm including global corporations. It's driven by the private sector because there is a realizable economic opportunity that exists today in the African continent. The 1.2 billion people that are referred to that need to get access to goods and services, consumer goods and services, $3.4 trillion of economy, which we're seeing increasingly starts to become traded within the African continent. In essence, the 54 countries that we've referred to starting to trade with each other with ease than before, creates a real economic opportunity. Importantly, in my view, as economic focus shifts from other parts of the, of, of the globe, where the, you know, the cost of production or cost of setting up factories and the labor costs are growing as a result of uh, the economic uh, development in those parts of the world, in, in certain parts of Asia um, and other parts of the world. I think what we are seeing, and, and this is, I think, confirmed by the number of global corporates that today are actually having an interest in the African continent, is how real the economic opportunity exists. So I think the fact that you've got the private sector, um, you've got the, the, you know, the regulators, you've got the governments converging in terms of the need to implement the free trade area. In my view, 
gives the free trade opportunity, the, the free trade area, the biggest opportunity for, of, for success. And I think the last six, six months in particular, since the first of um, uh, you know January 2021, have been very encouraging. I you know if I look at for example how ready countries like South Africa, countries like Kenya, countries like Egypt, countries like Morocco, and a few others are for the implementation already trading within the free trade agreement. Um, it's very encouraging. So I think for me, it is that. I think if you look at some of the previous initiatives, some of them might have been driven largely by governments without the private sector uh, you know, praising, playing a very key role. I referred earlier to the fact that a number of corporates in Africa uh, are meeting later today, and I'm part of those conversations, I set uh, up by the, the, the secretariat to deal with the question of the, the, the regional value chains opportunities that are now uh, very um, real and that we must now think about what it means from a financing perspective, what it means from um, you know, setting up uh, the necessary infrastructure in terms of power generation, in terms of roads and rail. So in a way, I think given those factors, I'm quite encouraged that this is a much more real initiative than we've ever seen before in the African continent. Just feeding on from that then, Bahani, I mean, is, is it your opinion that um, it, for this particular initiative that there is sufficient political will um, amongst the countries and the participants in the continent for this to be successful? Yeah, I and I think, I think there is sufficient political will, and, I, and we all must, must agree to this. We know that part of the challenge that, you know, initiatives such as the free trade agreement have and have would have had on the back of Brexit, for example, and on the back of what has happened in the EU with respect to countries like Greece and many others. It's the view that trade agreements tend to benefit the bigger economies and the bigger countries. And I think importantly in this case, the fact that um, the, the AU is learning from the lessons of, you know, seen in, this other, in, in these other parts of the world and making sure that there is due recognition that's given to the least developed countries to be able to develop their own industries, uh, give them a little bit more runway to develop their own industries before um, joining or before fully uh, uh, you know, complying with the requirements of the free trade area. It's quite important. And I think the fact that today, as we speak, there's 36 countries that have actually ratified the agreement, which essentially means, it's a very important point, essentially means that the, the, their parliaments beyond the governments themselves have actually ratified the agreement and have agreed and said, this makes a lot more sense for our country. This makes a lot more sense for our region. It's a very good point. I do want to touch on this point, Mark, because I think it's a very important point that oftentimes you know, gets raised. I think the fact that you've got eight regional economic communities that themselves have varying levels of uh, trade liberalization makes this not as huge a mountain as it looks. But in actual fact, if you think about it, it's about those eight regional economic blocks uh, now combining and making sure that instead of trading preferentially within those eight uh, regional economic blocks, we now trade preferentially um, for 54 countries within the, the African um, continent. So in my view, the, the, the ratification of the agreement, as well as the ongoing work on the, on the schedule of tariffs, for which 34 countries have already submitted the schedule of tariffs, is further proof of the political will and support mm -hmm for this to happen. I think what has given me even much more uh, excitement is also the resolution around, at least for 81% of goods on the, uh, you know, of, of, on, the, on the rules of origin, which if you look at some of the commentary in the past few months, was one of the biggest uh, hurdles that um, you know, was raised by various experts uh, globally. So I'm glad that we are there. So in, in, in short, I do think that there is sufficient political will. Uh, uh, Bahani, when it comes to, to the issue of, of zero tariffs, um, you know, yeah. zero tariffs means the loss of revenue 
um, for yeah. countries. And yeah. um, so, so what is the plan within the AU um, to support countries that feel that the, that the downside is higher than um, the upside due to the loss of revenue? Look, I mean, I think it's a, it's a very key point and, and a lot of um, um, experts have raised this issue uh, to say that there are multiple countries who make a lot of revenue out of the varying tariffs that they have and to suddenly have to reduce uh, those tariffs and, and at, at a point, of course, over the next five years on 90% of those goods and services there's going to be a revenue impact. It's encouraging that uh, African Bank um, has put together a, a billion dollar facility um, to support or to act as some form of support to these countries. Whilst it's not necessarily sufficient, I think that it's a good start. It, it does say that there's a lot of thought in terms of what kind of support can be given. Because I think one of the things about the free trade area is that, and this is the challenge if, if we are being, uh, you know, and, and a lot of experts do agree on this, is that in the short term, for some of the countries, you've got an immediate revenue hole that opens up. In the medium term to long term, as you improve on competitiveness and we build these regional value chains and, you know, more economies developed and so forth, you've got the upside of, of, of you know, uh, brought about by, these bigger economies as, you know, the growth in the GDP uh, and the increase in the intra africa trade and so forth. But in the meantime, the impact is that revenue hole that opens in the fiscus. And I think the, the gesture and the effort of the, uh, of the, of Africa's in bank here must be, must, must be, um, you know, uh, really applauded in that what it means is that there's a lot of thought to make sure that we can then create those frameworks that ensure that there is some form of uh, rebates or financial support that comes through because a country has actually agreed to implement the free trade area immediately. I know that there's a lot of work that is happening in terms of how that billion dollar facility would be utilized uh, for varying countries, but it's encouraging that, and it's not just the African bank, it's, it's many other banks that are thinking or many other development financial institutions that are thinking of the kind of support that might be required for some of the countries as that gap opens up. But clearly with a view that in the long term, in the medium term to long term, the growing economies, uh, the growth in the GDP, the growth in the multiple sectors should actually uh, compensate for that, for that revenue loss that is experienced on the back of zero tariffs. Um, I know one of the questions that's come through on the Q&A is, um, could you expand on the initiatives under this agreement, like the free movement of people? Um, for example, visa free, tra visa -free travel um, and work permits? Fantastic. And, and this is a great question because I think when you talk about, so, so let me take a step back, by the way. Um, the free trade agreement is essentially um, a component of, um, of, of, of Agenda 2063 by the AU that talks about free trade, but also talks about free movement of people. Um, you can't drive trade uh, without making it easy for people to move across uh, the board, across the continent. In this regard, there are countries that are already leading and making sure that they are opening up countries like Rwanda in terms of making sure that there's visa-free travel into Rwanda. But yes, um, it's an important component. I know that there's engagements with, within the free trade areas of a, a gradual approach of opening up in terms of uh, creating a visa-free travel environment. Um, and, and there are particular initiatives around that. So, so yes, the point you're raising is very valid. And yes, the free trade agreement or rather the AU in particular, uh, and the commission specifically. It's looking at relaxing and getting countries to relax a lot of some of these visa requirements in terms of the movement of the people. 
another question that's come through is, uh, is there clarity on the value add percentage in the producing country to be able to qualify for the, for the AFT CFA? There is clarity in terms of that. There's clarity in terms of the fact that, uh, you know, 8 to 1%. So, so there is clarity to the extent that it's, it's, it's going to differ on, it differs goods by goods, sector by sector. And this is important because so the level of complexity of some of the goods, uh, you know, of, of the goods produced are different. So this is why I refer to the fact that, and, and, and this is available with the, with the, with the AU, it's available with the, with the secretariat itself, that 81%, so there's been an agreement on 81% of goods in terms of what is the level of uh, value add that should be produced within the country. For the for the for the goods to qualify to become part of the of the free trade area, or for them to qualify for zero tariffs. So I think importantly here is that there's been an agreement on 81 percent of the goods um, in terms of the various tariff lines. Um, unfortunately, this differs in terms of uh, the goods applicable. But yes, there's a lot of progress on this. Um, and I think if you're keen to to understand this, you can get in touch, and we can make sure that. You can have access to these tariff lines, uh, lines through the through the uh, uh, secretariat. That's great, um, Bahani. The, the what would you see as the the key sectors um, that that generate opportunity for investment in Africa under this agreement? I think um, the obvious sector would be, you know, we speak about the. $100 billion infrastructure uh, requirement per annum over the next 10 years, which is a trillion dollars of infrastructure spend that is expected. I suppose there's a lot of infrastructure development that must happen across roads, across rail, um, across ports and many others. So I think that's, that's the one aspect. Um, there's also the fact that you need um, a reliable level of energy across the continent. So investment in energy, both in terms of uh, sustainable energy, uh, new energy, as well as um, you know, the old energy, if I may say, subject to um, what is doable in terms of ESG principles. It's another area of investment that I see. Um, and by the way, infrastructure development, also talking to digital infrastructure, a critical part of, of, of you know, um, what is expected to get better because as we trade or as Africa trades with each other, we need to be able to make instant payments. To be able to make instant payments, you need the infrastructure behind that. Um, and we need to make sure that communication is instant as well. To be able to do that, you need reliable infrastructure behind that. So it's not just physical infrastructure that becomes important, it's also digital infrastructure. So I'd look into those. But also, I think, um, you know, telecoms, a lot of um, infrastructure opportunities in terms of telecoms as well become quite critical. I also think that uh, on the back of what we saw in, in light of COVID challenges, um, investments in the pharmaceuticals become quite critical. I think um, Africa's ability to be able to generate a lot of or to produce a lot of vaccines within the continent. I've seen uh, the other day that... Um, uh, Senegal, for example, entered into, I think it's Senegal, entered into an agreement with Belgium in, with respect to the production of certain specific vaccines within the African continent. Aspen in, in, in South Africa is also, is also in the process of uh, developing and producing, producing vaccines um, uh, within that. So you, you do have in the pharmaceuticals, in my view, a lot of those opportunities. But also in terms of services themselves, um, financial services, transport services, as I've spoken to, um, uh, 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 transport services, financial services, business, well, telecoms, quite important. These are the sectors if I was, um, you know, global business, I would be thinking through in terms of that. I should also highlight that um, there's also, uh, you know, if you look at where Africa is, there has historically been a lot of talk in terms of uh, diversification of our export flows. So 
uh, there are still opportunities of vaccines in terms of beneficial minerals that are produced in the African continent. There's opportunities to avail in terms of um, you know, a cocoa in Ghana. I saw the other day that um, the, the expansion of a plant there to be able to add a lot more value in terms of cocoa um, in that. And then, of course, you've got East Africa, particularly Kenya, worth mentioning here in terms of uh, some of the work that is happening in the, in the technology space in there. So, so, so you might want to check what is happening in Kenya and East Africa in terms of the technology opportunities that exist. But overall, I think you might want to, if you are looking into the African continent, do look country by country, region by region, in terms of some of these opportunities that are going to open up in terms of these regional value chains. Thank you. Um, behind is a, a very interesting question which has come through on the um, on the Q and A. Um, yeah. Is the AFCFTA or the African Union tracking the volume of trade between the right. signatories since the yes. agreement came into force? And and very, is that yeah. data publicly available? So so here, that's a very good question, by the way. I think yes. There is a lot of work that is happening around the tracking of data. So, so if you look at um, the the number of countries um, that are have already uh, um, signed up, they, I think one of the encouraging things is that you've got the bigger countries in the form of South Africa, Kenya, Egypt, uh, Nigeria. Uh, Morocco and others, and Angola and others, that have already, that essentially, not only have they signed up, but you could argue that they do have the underlying infrastructure in terms of making sure that they can align an implementation of a free trade area, so the implementation of zero tariffs with the expectation in terms of the free trade area. So, so you do get a lot of the data that comes from the bigger countries in terms of that. So that is that is already something that is reported anyway. So so the reporting of the trade, which is now a specific in terms of intra-trade, because we already do that, right? Um, uh, you know, and that's why we can work, work out the fact that you already have you you have seventeen percent uh, intra-Africa trade. So that reporting infrastructure already exists. But I think even post. Uh, going live on the 1st of, of, of July, there is more data that is now coming to the fore in terms of the particular countries that have already taken advantage or are taking advantage of the free trade area. Um, and I think that's a very important part of this whole thing. I believe that I will raise this, this directly with, 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 the, with the Secretary personally that maybe there needs to be some updates in terms of how much of um, this trade that we are starting to see is happening on the back of the free trade agreement. Um, so th there is a lot of existing infrastructure, but increasingly I have seen a little bit more initiatives to make sure that um, some of this trade, uh, I was listening to the uh, you know, uh, Secretary, Secretary General the other day who was highlighting some of the trade that is happening between some of these countries, so these, between some of these countries. So this data is obviously available. And by the way, it was also had that, for example, countries um, that have signed up in terms of um, the preferential trade agreement were engaging on this, but the underlying infrastructure were still charging whatever the, 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 the tariffs were. There was a platform created in terms of rebates. Um, Again, I think um, you know it, it will be very important to get an update on that. But I think most likely you'd find that the bigger countries are able to implement such that the smaller countries that are still creating the necessary infrastructure or aligning the necessary infrastructure to implement zero tariffs. I should indicate here that there's also an, an important initiative by the free trade area, which it's, an, it's on the non-tariff barrier. So I know we didn't touch on this. But there is a digital platform that's been created by the free trade area. You can go to you can reach on that. And when you experience challenges, whether it is um, uh, you know in terms of the movement of 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 your goods across 
uh, you know, countries and so forth, you can highlight this. And this data is now um, now looked at. It is it is it is uh, collated, but importantly, it is raised up to the various members of the free trade areas to pay attention to and to prioritize resolution. Uh, uh, so, honey, with the implementation of the uh, of the free trade agreement, does this mean that um, Comesa is no longer applicable? Oh, very good one. Um, what it is is, so I think it's an important aspect, right? So uh, it does not mean that Comesa is not applicable. As I indicated earlier, you've got eight regional economic zones, so Comesa, SADC, EAC, and, 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 and the rest, right? Those would have had significant levels of trade liberalization. And in the main, in many cases, they would have already been at zero tariffs for a number of goods. And this is what made it, or it's, it's made it a little bit easier because you're not dealing 54 countries as such, you are do, you're dealing eight regional economic communities within those, of course, dealing the countries. So, so in essence, um, the, you know, the agreements that exist within are going to, over time, I suppose, um, uh, you know, just become part of the free trade area. Uh, you know, but I think that's um, it's it's a gradual progression. So some of the deals that and and there is a lot of work to make sure that um, within the free trade areas, anyway, there was already free trade or there is already free trade. Now to make sure that some of the deals that uh, countries would have had with Cobesa or with um, you know the SADC and so forth, it it becomes easier to scale up to the free trade area to scale up to a deal with the 54 countries because um, you know a lot of those standards that were uh, were adopted adopted within those free trade uh, within those those regional economic agree uh, agreements as the same standards that are being adopted within the free trade area. So we, uh, I think we're running right on time now, but uh, we've got time for one more question. Um, so, honey, we, we, you've mentioned on a number of occasions now that obviously 36 countries have ratified this this, this free trade agreement. Um, that leaves us now, you know, another 18 countries that we're waiting for. Do we have any indication as to um, when the balance of the countries will will ratify the agreement to to have full participation? I think the, the, the good thing is there is a lot of conversation in those 18 countries that I haven't ratified. And when you look at the fact that in five to six months, we are at 36 countries. I mean, we were at, um, uh, of, you know, in, in five to six months of, of, of um, the agreement having gone live, we're at 36 countries. I think we can expect that within the next few months, you will have um, probably, it, uh, you know, I can hazard a guess at least ten countries that have joined it because a lot of those there's a lot of engagement and I did see that there's a lot of work that is done through the secretariat into these countries to allay some of the challenges that you know various legislatures may be raising. But I think the good thing is once you have trade commencing, which ha it has, and a lot of other countries start to see some of the benefits. I think um, you will have the evidence even pushing a lot more countries to join the free trade area. Um, you know, for me, the fact that you have a lot of the key economies having joined is a positive in that it means that you're going to see a lot more activity uh, done at zero tariffs within that. And the fact that you're having uh, discussions among the 36 countries in terms of sector prioritizations. It's also another positive in terms of services, um, uh, you know, trade in, 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 in this prioritized sector. So in a way, I do think that over the next few months, we should expect more. But look, it is possible that we get to the end of the year uh, and there are still a few more remaining. The good thing is that doesn't stop trading uh, or preferential trading within the members of the free trade area that have ratified the agreement and have deposited the schedule of tariffs. Um, so in essence, this is a gradual implementation. And I think if you look at, and I was reading somewhere, if you look at the pace of implementation for the free trade agreement and compare that to the other 
uh, regions, the EU and others, in terms of uh, you know, how long it took for some of the members to join, I think this has been exceptionally impressive. So in a way, uh, you know, it's very encouraging that way. It's at 36 and maybe by the end of this, you know, H1, um, we, we are to 40 and then hopefully by the end of the year, got everybody, every country within the free area. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Mahani, thank you very much for unpacking this, uh, uh, this topic for us assessingly. Um, I think it's certainly been a, a very enlightening hour. Thank you. Um, and um, we may even ask you to come back um, sometime in the future and uh, give us a progress update on uh, just what has been happening. Thank you very much, uh, Mark, and thanks to everyone. And I look forward to more engagement and through permission and others will continue to, say, to share some of this because it's important uh, that as a continent, this, this becomes right. And institutions like ours are very important, of course, in terms of the financing of some of these initiatives. And, and bodies like uh, the South African Chamber of Commerce and various chapters are quite critical in this agenda as we think about the next phase of Africa's development uh, story. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Bahani. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our, uh, our presentation for the day. Thank you very much for your time um, and for spending the time with us. Um, if you would like any further information on the SA Chamber of Commerce in Singapore, please, by all means, go on and have a look at our website. Um, you can check out our Facebook page. You can see us on LinkedIn. And um, a recording of this webinar will be posted on YouTube shortly. Um, and also a special thank you to our colleagues at the uh, South African Chamber of Commerce in South Korea for this collaboration today. It may be our first one, but uh, I'm sure it won't be our last. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day.